Judges, scissors, fire. All these elements from the story of the Passion of Joan of Arc find their way into the physical history of this most spiritual of films. From its premiere until the discovery in 1981 in Oslo, Norway, of an intact print of Dreyer's original cut, the film had only been seen over the years in mangled, edited, and censored versions when it had been seen at all. Here, we'll take a look at the history of these versions and compare clips from two of them against the definitive version, known as the Oslo print. The Passion of Joan of Arc premiered in Copenhagen on April 21st, 1928, at the Cinema Palace Teatret. The Danish newspaper BT reported that the Paris premiere was scheduled for a few days later, on May 2nd. However, the official Paris premiere did not take place until October 25th, delayed by a French nationalist campaign against the film. They did not believe that a foreign director, and a non-Catholic at that, should be trusted with the myth of Joan of Arc. Jean-Joseph Frappa was the screenwriter of a competing film, 1929's La Vie Merveilleuse de Jeanne d'Arc, which had a more heroic outlook on Joan's life. He wrote in January 1927 of Dreyer and of rumors that Lillian Gish was to play Joan, whatever the talent of the director, and he has it, he cannot give us a Joan in the true French tradition, and the American star cannot be our Joan, wholesome, lively, shining with purity, faith, courage, and patriotism. To let this be made in France would be a scandalous abdication of responsibility. In between the April and October premieres, Dreyer showed his film to representatives of the Catholic Church in the library of Notre Dame. There is reason to believe that they demanded changes as a result. As Caspar Tubier notes elsewhere in this edition, the sheet music for the score played at the Paris premiere indicates that the scene where the judges try to blackmail Joan into signing her confession by withholding the sacrament was cut from that version. It exists in full in the Oslo print. But French audiences were not to see Dreyer's film, censored or otherwise, for much longer. On December 6, 1928, a fire consumed the labs of the Ufa studio in Berlin, where cinematographer Rudolf Maté had developed the film. The original negative was destroyed, leaving only a few already worn copies in distribution. Dreyer was completely devastated, his film seemingly lost forever to disaster. However, there was a solution, if an imperfect one. Famous throughout his career for requiring actors to rework even the briefest moment, Dreyer was able to create an entirely new version from alternate takes, thankfully stored elsewhere. Using a release print for comparison, Dreyer and editor Marguerite Boget created a new negative which matched the original almost shot for shot. Many could not tell the difference, though a disappointed Dreyer could. Notice here, for instance, that the skull does not land upright when it falls in the alternate take, as it does in Dreyer's first choice shot. Differences aside, the end result appeared to be the same. The second negative was thought lost to another fire, this time at the labs of GM de Boulogne Biancourt in 1929. As the 30s and 40s passed, prints from the first negative became rarer and rarer, those from the second slightly less so. There was no stopping the physical loss of one of the great classics of silent film. Two decades later, the film would be resurrected, only to be re-edited. In 1951, the French film historian Lo Duca discovered, in the vaults of Gaumont Studios, an intact negative in wonderful condition. It was almost certainly Dreyer's second version, apparently not lost in that second fire. Unfortunately, Duca took this negative and made significant changes, such as this elaborate credit sequence. Using a patchwork score of Bach, Albinoni, and Vivaldi, Duca sonorized the film with an optical soundtrack that cut off the left side of the original picture's framing. Notice that the opening intertitles are gone, replaced by a completely new voiceover. This narration refers to the 28 sessions of the historical trial, undermining Dreyer's deliberate decision to collapse all the action into one day. Le 23 mai 1429, Jeanne fut faite prisonnière. Grande fut la joie parmi les Bourguignons et les Anglais. On tenait la pucelle. L'Université de Paris était alors le soleil de la chrétienté et clamait sa compétence en matière de foi. Par scrupules religieux et par raison politique, elle soupçonnait la pucelle d'être inspirée du démon. Mais Paris était bourguignon, c'est-à-dire anglais. L'Université demanda donc au duc de Bourgogne de lui livrer sa prisonnière. 
Philippe, Jean de Luxembourg et leurs conseillers anglais eux-mêmes mirent deux mois à s'y décider. Cochon vint la réclamer, offrant 10 000 francs d'or, rançon d'un prisonnier royal. Conduite à Rouen, Jeanne fut mise au fer. Le procès s'ouvrit le 21 février 1431. Il y eut 28 séances. C'est Jeanne elle-même et non la guerrière. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison between the opening shots of the Loduca version and the Oslo print. Differences in camera motion, facial expression, and character action exist throughout the length of the shot, proving that Duca in fact worked from the second negative. There are various differences. The scribe enters at a different angle, the English soldier does not wipe the seat of the stool with his sleeve, and Cochon, in his first shot, strokes his chin. Another example, the bloodletting scene, perhaps the most obvious, if not the most tasteful way, to show the difference between the two versions. As scholar Caspar Tubier mentions in his commentary in this edition, a real arm provides real blood in this shot, though it belongs to an extra and not to Falconetti. In the Oslo print, no doubt the first take is used. The blood exits with much more vigor. In the alternate version, it has to be coaxed a bit. Wherever possible, Duca replaced intertitles with subtitles. Otherwise, he replaced the original, simple intertitles with text over images of stained glass windows and church pews. The negative itself was lost, but Lo Duca's version was shown for years, despite Dreyer's vociferous objection. Dreyer wrote a letter to Gaumont in 1956 that ended with this paragraph. The editor has tried to make the film more accessible to the general public by appealing to the public's bad taste. Since you appreciate art films, it would indeed be a worthy act on your part to make a copy of the silent version with the intertitles on a simple black background, as I did in the original. An old film classic is a museum piece that should be restored to its original form. In my opinion, to modernize such a film is an absurdity. In the 1960s, Arne Krog of the Danish Film Institute attempted to fulfill Dreyer's request. He put together a sort of best guess version from all existing prints. His primary source material seems to have been a version of the second negative, perhaps one from Holland. Another source was a print held at the National Film Archive in London, which, while missing over 190 shots and a dozen intertitles, according to film scholar Tony Pipolo, does inexplicably contain shots found in no other version, such as these establishing shots. The presence of establishing shots in an otherwise incomplete print remains a mystery, although we now know that they did not appear in Dreyer's final cut. Scholars such as David Bordwell have used the existence of these outtakes to highlight the aesthetic choices that Dreyer made. Establishing shots were filmed, but Dreyer chose to remain with repeated close-ups. Finally, in 1981, while cleaning out a closet in the Dikemark Sikkehus, a mental institution just outside Oslo, Norway, a workman found several film canisters. These were sent to the Norwegian Film Institute, who stored them for three years without review. When they were opened, the canisters revealed not just the print of The Passion of Joan of Arc, but also that it was stamped with the Danish censor's approval and the date, 1928. This stamp was a formality and did not indicate that changes had been made. It is well documented that uncensored copies were exported to Copenhagen and that the Danish censor required no changes to the film. But how did such a precious copy of one of the great classics of early cinema end up in such a place? Maurice Druzy, who translated the Danish intertitles into the French titles found in this edition, guesses that the medical director of the Institute, Harold Arneson, was simply interested. He was an amateur historian who had just published a book on the French Revolution. In his article, La Passion de Jeanne d'Arc, a classic film rises from the ashes, Eric Breitbart writes, there are no records of it ever being shown publicly in Oslo, but program notes found in one of the film cans suggest that the film had been screened privately several times. But after these few screenings, the print was stored away, and no one thought to ask for its return. So, 50 years after being denounced, cut, and burned, The Passion of Joan of Arc was resurrected for a third time in its visually stunning original version. And thanks to the ongoing work of film institutions such as the Danish Film Institute, Gaumont, the Cinémathèque Française and the Centre National du Cinéma, 
Jones should be safe from further disaster.